everyone to our Future of Vehicles meetup from Startup Autobahn hosted with our founding anchor partner Mercedes. I hope all of you are doing good and you're ready to deep dive with us in the topics of in-car hygiene as well customer journey. For everyone who is like new in our room here, uh, welcome to Startup Autobahn to the family. Everybody who joined us already a little bit beforehand, welcome back. Um, who maybe don't know me, my name is Hannah. I'm a senior program manager of this open innovation platform. And with my colleagues Theo and Timo, you will meet them later. Uh, we will guide you through this uh, 80, 85 minutes. So maybe this people who maybe know us and visit us. So maybe raise your hand if you know this background. So we kind of changed our place where we're streaming. So since last week, we are back in our office. Normally, we would host you to in our private home. Now we are in our office uh, in Stuttgart, Stuttgart Feying in Arena 2036 and do the first time this live stream. And maybe sometimes you will see people passing by or like my colleagues, they are like working left and right. And behind the camera, I can see Aaron, Basti, Robin, all are waving and saying hi to all of you. And millions of cables here around. But yeah, we are excited to try it out and we hope you like this kind of live event. And we was not sure like all oh, like long time ago, 2016, okay, so long time ago it's not, but we start this journey. And I think on this beginning, we not really imagine this amazing ride we did. So we started 2016 with our founding team. It was Daimler, was University of Stuttgart, Arena 2036 and Plug and Play. And now with 30 partners, we're working on mobility, production, sustainability topics, and so more uh, with more than 200 startups. And this is so far, really successful and really happy to have you here. As well, we have two new partners uh, joining us. So Sikisui and ADAC, welcome to the team. Future of vehicles was always an important topic for us, but the ground or like everything right now changed. So our focus changed as well. Like if you look at yourself, how you maybe have a different behavior in the last three, four months, like this cannot pass by the innovation world. So we have now each month or we had each month a future of workplaces events, production and supply chain events, um, new, um, new luxury events um, and all this, um, yeah, in this virtual world and today the future of vehicles event. I'm just checking with my team if we're moving slides because on my screen we're not moving slides but it works. Okay cool then you see something different than I do but this should work. Okay next to the, all these events where we look for new startups uh, for new innovation we can hopefully work in the future. Our partners work with the program eight startups on amazing POCs um, and we will showcase them on our expo day in September. Um, you can stay tuned. We have really cool concepts and plans for this and we'll share them soon. And I think you all are invited as well to join us here in September. But yeah, we are here for today, right? So uh, we already started this morning as well yesterday to meet all the startups you meet later um, in one on one meetings with our partners to see if there's possibilities to work together. Um, now, like, like after me, um, our hosts from the plug and play side, Sasha will do a welcome and from the Mercedes side, Felix, he's like project manager at Startup Auto Band Mercedes, they will say hi. Afterwards, we invited Katya. She is mobility expert and will talk about, okay, maybe who's actually driving mobility and with her keynote, change for the better needs diversity. After this, we invited 10 startups from all over the globe. We have a startup from New Zealand, I think Sweden is with us, America, one from Germany, from Stuttgart, so across kind of the street. And Theo and Timo will give you a little bit more introduction in our topic. 
as well introduce you to all the startups. And afterwards, we have an interview with Jens. He is co-founder and CEO of Placlane, like how the coronavirus changed mobility and what was his experience in this whole period to see, OK, what do I need to do now to be long time successful? And I think this is an amazing lineup. And I'm really, really grateful for all the startups who are joining us today, all the speakers, our team around, our co-host uh, Mercedes to set this up. And I think the lineup and everything that is coming up can speak for themselves. If you want to read more about the speakers, startups, want to have a look again on the agenda we showed beforehand, you can go to this Notion document and maybe one of my team members will post this again in the chat, but all of you should get it uh, via email, maybe via the info package or calendar invite your colleagues sent you from our partners. And there you can like, yeah, get a little bit more information. And in the end, of course, we are right now online and normally our events are in person. But if you have any questions to the startups, you can ask them over the chat. I'm not sure if the chat version is here or here, but one side you will see it um, oh, down. I have no idea. <laughs> OK, I get the side. It's on this side, <laughs> is it? OK, maybe. But yeah, you can ask chat um, your questions. The startup will reply over there. And then later on with the chat with Jens, you can ask them and I will ask it directly. And I would say I think we have over 200 people in the room. Maybe not. My team left me on the other side, though. No. Um, but I would like to hand over to Sasha so we can Start with the program and Sasha, can we switch the screen as uh, the seat? Are you around? OK, see you later. Okay. Am I on? Fantastic. So thank you, Hannah, and welcome to our fourth meetup of program eight at Startup Autobahn. Today hosted by our valued founding partner and initiator of the Startup Autobahn Open Innovation Platform, Timeler. Since our inception four years ago, we constantly tweaked the program and services in order to improve the efficiency of the collaboration between the startup and corporate partners. What has become more and more apparent, especially in the past months, is that the technologies from these young specialized high tech companies have been gaining importance in the general digitization activities across all industries. Our job and objectives are to have an efficient way to work with these startups. That means to have a well-oiled framework to test new startups technologies fast, focused, and in a cost-efficient way, and also being result-oriented. Together with the Daimler business units and the tech experts from various fields, we already pursued a total of about 150 POCs, which typically run only for a few weeks to a few months. Roughly a third of them went into continued pilot phase or are already implemented. Our partners tell us that this pace of tech turnaround is amazing, even if many of the startups might only be building blocks in the big frame of their digitization strategy. We really like to thank Daimler and our 29 active and engaged industry partners on the Startup Autobahn platform for being role models in the collaboration with startups, for having turned around this many successful pilot projects and to keep on going strong. Together, we are striving to find new solutions with cutting edge, technolo cutting edge technologies in order to continue to build the best and most innovative future cars, which also deliver a great and personalized luxury experience. Since we are hosting this event together with Daimler, I'd like to say a special thanks to all of you which have been involved in the startup projects and especially to our key contacts who helped drive the topic of open innovation inside Daimler. That is Philip, Maike, Felix and Dennis. To switch to today's topics, people who know me understand that I'm a big shopper. By the way, I'm still looking for the right car and that I'm a very picky and clean guy. So I'm really looking forward to the new tech of in-vehicle hygiene and online customer experience, which you will see in a few minutes. And with that, I would like to give it up to Felix. Thank you.
Thank you, Hannah and Sasha, for the kind introduction. My name is Felix kappenkastro Blucher, and I'm in charge of the scouting at Startup Autobahn Mercedes-Benz. Welcome to this meetup. As one of the four anchor partners of Startup Autobahn, it is very important to us to find answers for a quick changing world. Answers through technology. We've invited great startups who are targeting the topics in car hygiene and customer journey and digital and contactless sales. So on the one hand, how can we stay safe in our beautiful cars? And on the other hand, how can we create a great experience purchasing them? Although it's currently not possible to have a live event, I'm getting used to the virtual setup and it's a great alternative for us. Since 2016, we've had over 150 pilot projects and over 14 serial implementations. I'm looking forward for many, many more. So let's all make the best out of the virtual sessions and adapt the speed of the startups. I hope to see you soon in person. Thank you, Felix. Always a pleasure to organize days like this with our startup Autobahn Mercedes team. We all know diversity matter. And at the end, we all drive mobility. Felix, and we spoke beforehand if we should talk more from the startup Autobahn team about new mobility, or if we should get somebody inspiration from the outside of our platform. So we are really happy to have Katja with us today. She is thought leader focusing on new mobility, new work and diversity. She is organizing twice a month a podcast, She Tries Mobility, and is pushing ahead mobility topics on the federal board of Verkehrs Club Deutschland e.V. For her inspiration work, she has been as example recognized as Remarkable Woman in Transport 2020, and we are really happy to have her here today with us, speaking about the change for the better needs diversity. Katja, the screen is yours. Thank you for this kind introduction and thank you, Hannah, for the invitation for today. My name is Katja Diel and I'm coming to you from Hamburg, um, which is really funny because um, I'm getting used to have keynotes and impulse um, doing from virtual reality, but it's really strange for me not to look in your eyes and see your reactions, but hopefully um, I can reach out and um, open your mind for some things I have in mind when I talk about the future of mobility, which is already beginning right now. I will share my screen with you. Hopefully this will work. Um, and I think um, we need diversity to change the mobility for the better for all of us. Because at the moment we have some blind spots happening um, regarding the group of people who is now building up the future mobility. And I like really what I heard from Hannah that you are already doing what I'm calling out for. You are meeting each other even if you don't work in the same company. You are really diverse from your ages and your um, jobs you are doing. So maybe you're not the first peer group I need to reach out um, to change, but maybe you can foster this um, with me together uh, in, in by leaving uh, the room afterwards and having some new ideas how you can foster diversity in your jobs. And some words uh, from my side, I worked as a journalist uh, starting uh, for the German press agency and maybe my curiosity was uh, never stopped until then because I really like to ask questions and to find answers together with others. And then I started to work for PTO business. Um, I worked also in the logistics area and uh, for railway uh, companies, um, but I left um, and now I'm working for door to door, uh, which is a ride pooling um, company and is doing the job with uh, PTO business in the region of Germany and Dach region. But I also have my freelance business, with, which is called uh, She Drives Mobility. The she is me. <laughs> and I'm trying to um, have a different approach um, how we can build the future of mobility. Because when I wanted to change it in the corporates I worked before, I always felt a little bit like this uh, white goat on the right side because the others were all male and they are having fights against each other. And I was asking, where are the customers right now? Are you customer centric? What are we talking about? Why do you foster this kind of uh, again each other? against each other and why do we do this as a group of people and regarding the future of building up 
a really good mobility for everyone outside there. Because when you look upon the people who are now um, in the most highest hierarchy in the ministries and the management boards from um, our country, uh, I think it's really obvious that it's not diverse. The groups are really the same, and I don't really want to point anyone special because I think every one of them is really good in doing his or her business. But I think we need more diversity from the beginning of everything. And that means also we need diversity in politics. When you look upon this um, expert board, which is working for Mr. Scheuer, you see that they are really healthy, they are white, they are, have, they are having a special age. And I think they have really the willing of doing future mobility, but maybe their blind spots are lacking um, regarding all the elderly people, regarding people in wheelchairs, people who can't see, and even small children. So for me, it's kind of mix it up, um, kind of being um, yeah, proud of diversity. Because when you're sitting in a zero and I clone myself and I have five Katyas sitting there and I have an idea, every one of these Katyas will say, oh, wow, it's just such a good idea. I just think the same as you did just one second before you told me. And I think it's not so, it's not mean or bad. It's just a blind spot and you need someone who will ask you questions. Why are, do, are you doing this this way? Why can't we see it from another point of view? And it's not about female or male, it's just about the mix of people and uh, being really proud of to mix a, a group of people up and to have different kinds of views. And also, I see diversity is not the easiest part. You must step out of your comfort zone. And this will be something which we are not used to as human beings because we like our comfort zone so much. But innovation won't start in the comfort zone. It's just outside the comfort zone and you have to go this step beyond to have innovation and to grow a really difficult way to go. But I think it's really worth it. And I would want to empower you to do this the next days you are going. Because when you're really honest to yourself, are you really feeling comfortable with the traffic we have in our German cities? I think no. Um, I asked someone to paint a picture how I feel when I look upon a city like Berlin, Hamburg or Munich. And I think everyone is going his ways or her ways, but no one is really feeling like it's fluid, like it's really easy going because the space is lacking for all those outside of there who are doing their mobility every day in the cities we live in. And I think it's really um, a lack of um, how to have an order, how to have something we can manage upon mobility in the streets because we, we grow. The streets were built in the 60s or 50s and um, now we have this lack of place everywhere and we need to have a, no, a new system running outside of there and to yeah, empower the people to have their own mobility like they want to have it, but we manage it better for everyone else who's not doing the same mobility as you have. And also the PTOs are not the good guys in this kind of question because they are having a really horrible <laughs> system of uh, selling tickets. There are so many special things you need to know when you um, want to buy a ticket in a city you don't know. And I think it's not easy to understand the system of PTO business. So no one is nudged to leave his car or her car for maybe a ride with a PTO because it's so horrible to understand. Also, they must adjust their customer-centric view mobility as a service. Do you remember? It came up some years ago and to be honest I never understood what this should be because mobility as a service, everyone is doing his or her mobility, everyone is saying this is the kind of service I need but no answer will be the same if you ask people what is your um, thinking about uh, mobility as a service. There's always a different approach, there are always different needs and I think um, we really have to open our minds to see, okay, I got my framing. Maybe I'm a bicyclist, maybe I'm a car driver, but I have to look upon if I build another mobility, 
um, how can I see the people who have special needs who are not the same as mine? And I have a mind as mobility as a service, as a, a young lady who is having a child, who is having a job, who is maybe fostering someone else, elderly person, a care work. Um, and I know, yes, of course, there are also men doing this. But uh, Corona has shown us for, yeah, to say as a pity of Corona is um, that again, females are doing the care work and the care work is invisible. So also the mobility they need is invisible when they don't own a car. And maybe um, car builders and PTO companies and maybe also the taxis can have um, a kind of collaboration to have a new mobility for people who don't own a driver's license, for example, because there are 14 million people who don't own it. And I think they are also worth it to shown upon having their mobility really done in, in a mobility pattern, not in a one way mobility like car and PTO, that they have multimodal approaches and they have special needs every time the clock switches an hour later. Because it's, it's really, yeah, it's a fact that females are having a different mobility pattern than uh, males. It's uh, also from the roads you came from that the man in the family owns the family car and he's doing his drivers um, to the work and back and the care work of the lady in the house is more like multimodal as I told you before. It's more about PTO but it's also more about going by foot. And this is maybe, if you be honest, um, uh, mobility we do every day. Every one of us who is able to walk, walks every day. And even if you are doing it all, we are not looking upon how we can have a good walking path through a city. So I think it's really worth it to look upon this kind of um, facts and to foster a system that is um, embracing the different needs of mobility. You remember? We talked about zeros before. We talked about really homogeneous groups now um, yeah, doing the mobility for our uh, country. But do you think, um, as I told you a story before, of different mobility patterns, that they are able to have a look upon all these kind of different patterns we have? I don't think so. There's a really nice quote, nice quote from a customer of mine, Civility Management Consultant, asked um, many um, PTO business leaders in Germany last year um, how they are yeah, looking upon their digitization in their company. And they said, in most companies, a technology-driven culture prevails in which people are not the focus of intention. It is the people who change the company and, in the process, must also develop their own attitudes and behavior. What does it mean for you? Do you have the people of your company in the center of thinking digitization? Or are you just looking upon technique and um, yeah, how to approach better technique for the digitization? Because the people in your company, they have the digital mindset, do they? So ask yourself some questions. Are you having diversity mindset? Who do you hire? Which disciplines do you prefer when you hire people? Are this kind of different um, people from yourself? Because I have a podcast, it's also called She Dress Mobility. In the first year, I just asked uh, female leaders of the mobility companies how they came to the business. And no one of them was straight. They came from other branches, they came from other companies, they've been a hair cutter before, they've been someone who worked with gardens. And I think this shows mobility is something that needs a different approach also from the people who build it. It's not about just BVA and VVA, it's also about people who have maybe done social jobs because they know the people who are in need of care work, who are the System relevant Berufe, you remember, they don't, they are not able to own a car because they are so less paid. So with whom do you work the most? Is it someone who leaves you in your comfort zone or are you trying to beat yourself a bit by going outside your comfort zone, working with people who don't have the same mindset as yours? 
what do you think? Do you know your core competencies? Are you trying to be a generalist? Or are you trying to be really good in something and um, have an approach to being better and better? Interesting questions, or? So for me, I have some, I don't know, advices. I um, looked upon three silos. I know it's the mobility providers, the companies, but also the local authorities. And I think the mobility providers are really good when they are doing some collaboration with people. A PTO um, running system doesn't need something to build up like a software system. There are people around who are already doing this. So if you are searching for someone who can erase your digitization by doing some algorithm and stuff, ask someone who is doing this for ages. Don't do it yourself. And companies, now as we know Corona, we all have the privilege of having um, some jobs who are really doing good with remote working. Uh, Verkehrsmen is also avoiding some ways we did before, is avoiding flying in a, um, Germany. So for me, companies can do really much um, to change mobility behavior of their people who are working for them. But also the focus of, of local authorities can be, we want to change the mobility of our region. We want to be the ones who are now deciding what we want to have in the city or in the rural area. We want to create a space where it's worth living in, where people are staying and not moving away because it's so noisy and it's so stuck with people and cars. For me, it's this kind of vision I want to implement. It's we drive mobility. At the moment, it's she drive mobility, which is me, Katja. But I like to invite you to be we drive mobility. As you see in the picture, there are many people doing this. It's the PTOs, it's the car drivers, it's people with wheelchairs, it's from different, different ages. And they are all really happy to have a place together called the mobility of the future. So please be yeah, strong enough to have a diverse team, be strong enough to think in a different way and to invite people who leave you not in your comfort zone, but who are nudging you to go out of sight of this. And I think we can do it all and it's starting with small steps, but it's starting and I hope you will be in the team of Redrive Mobility. Thank you so much for your attention. You find my contact details here, reach out to me. I'm looking forward to have your impression of this kind of impulse. All right, thank you. And hi, everyone. For those of you who do not know me, I'm Theodora, part of the Ventures team at Startup Autobahn, where I focus on emerging technologies that are driving the next wave of innovation in mobility, production, and enterprise. Now, I want us all to do a little exercise and think back to January 1st of this year. We were shaking hands with everyone we met. The words social distancing made absolutely no sense to us. Getting tested meant something, oh well, completely different back then, and touching surfaces didn't cause too much overthinking. But at some point, it almost felt like the world stopped spinning, at least for some time, and that just to make way for a microorganism that we now know as coronavirus. It demanded that we put the brakes on the global economy to prevent its spread. So all the big corporations and leaders had to coordinate a global shutdown of the economy. It was an experiment we have never done before, but one that had a ripple effect all around the world. This outbreak has touched us all and we are all forever changed in some major ways, but also some minor ways. Overnight, personal hygiene and social distancing became everyone's top priority. So it is no wonder that health concerns also infiltrated into the minds of car buyers, particularly since closed vehicle environments pose a higher risk of infection. In a post-pandemic world, washing or maintaining the cleanliness of the car takes a whole new meaning. The virus has accelerated trends which just began to emerge in the last few years, such as air purification, antimicrobial materials and self-cleaning surfaces. So let us now explore what the future holds for car makers because that's what we do best here at Startup Autobahn. 
New customer expectations around vehicle hygiene will impact the entire mobility industry. To put some numbers behind it, according to a five-country market survey done in China, US, Japan, Germany, and Italy, 80% of car owners said that they would pay extra for technology that could sterilize their vehicle. And they are more likely to consider air quality features for their next vehicle than they were before the outbreak. There is no wonder that all the big car manufacturers are diving into next generation tech to virus proof their vehicles and win over concerned customers. One thing is clear when it comes to the variety of innovative technologies. The options are abundant and most of them go beyond simply spraying disinfectant into the cabin air. For instance, one potential solution is blasting car interiors with ultraviolet light. Since UVA or UVC sterilization works by attacking the cell's DNA, it is not safe for human exposure. The feature can only be activated when the car is not occupied. But with the help of motion sensors, determining car occupancy should be easy. Then, the UV lamps can be integrated into the existing lighting systems, into the headliner console, or into the ceiling so that it reaches seats, floor mats, dashboard, and the steering wheel simultaneously. Although bursts of UV light treatment are effective for periodic cleans in the vehicle, they are by no means providing continuous protection. Moreover, UV light can also break down the chemical bonds in plastics and similar materials that can be found in the car. Moving on, another obvious solution is upgrading air filtration systems to kill microbes, bacteria, and airborne viruses. For this, there is a need to evolve the HVAC systems to provide drivers and passengers with the best possible air quality. There are usually two steps taken into account. First, to strip outside air of bacteria and pollution before entering the cabin. And secondly, to systematically scrub the air inside the cabin and inactivate any critical virus particles. Other disinfection techniques use vapor bombing with chemicals such as hydrogen peroxide. This intermittent solution can be effective, but not for achieving continuous protection. Another emerging trend that coronavirus is fueling is the need for more segregated climate zones in the cockpit. I'm sure we will hear more about this technology in the future. Meanwhile, some automakers are taking a bit more extreme measures and are looking at software solutions that can temporarily raise the interior car temperatures be beyond 15 degrees Celsius. 15 minutes are enough to reduce the viral concentration inside the vehicle because heat permeates the entire cabin. This process is quite efficient and should not damage interior parts. But there is also a need to equip the car with additional cleaning features. Thus, car manufacturers are also paying attention to antimicrobial and smart materials that repel viruses. In addition, self-cleaning or easily cleanable surfaces are also in high demand. For example, different car interior companies are looking at antimicrobial leather and fabrics that can resist viruses, bacteria and fungus, or at antimicrobial paints and coatings that can give a clean finishing to surfaces. All right, so now that we have mapped out some of the most important trends emerging for in-vehicle hygiene, Let's turn our attention to the five companies that have been carefully curated by Daimler and our team for their unique technologies. Super, a big thank you to all our guest companies for joining us today. As we are now reaching the end of our tech session on in-car hygiene, I would like to pass it on to my colleague Timo, who will talk about the new definition of customer journey. Thank you. Thank you.
Thanks, Theodora, and a big thanks to all the startups for presenting their technologies. Hello, everyone. First of all, a warm welcome also from my side. My name is Timo, and I'm part of the Ventures team at Plug and Play Startup Autobahn. After having heard great presentations about hygiene in the car, I would like to introduce the second topic that we are covering today, customer journey. Before we start with the second round of presentations, I would like to introduce a startup that is not linked to today's topic, but definitely to another topic that is connected to the future of vehicles, sustainability. The startup I would like to introduce was part of our last startup Autobahn program. Opus 12, a startup from California, has developed a device that recycles CO2 into chemicals and fuels by the help of water and electricity. Together with Daimler, they have developed a car part made of CO2. The following video will give you some insights into their technology and how our platform accelerates corporate startup collaboration. <laughs> So at Opus 12, we've developed technology that can recycle CO2 emissions. So we can make products that are normally made from fossil fuels, but we're making them from CO2. So they can end up either carbon neutral or even carbon negative. In partnership with Daimler, we made the world's first auto part made from carbon dioxide. What we did is we took CO2, turned it into the feedstocks for a material called polycarbonate, and then worked with Daimler's existing supply chain, their existing plastic supplier and their existing tier one manufacturer to actually make a part that would be compatible with the Mercedes A-Class. And we got very lucky because our champion at Daimler, Udo Geyer, was excellent at navigating both the internal organization at Daimler as well as the existing supply chain. So as a result, we built something that people wouldn't have expected was even possible in this time frame. Startup Autobahn played a critical role in this project uh, because I actually came here to Stuttgart about a little less than a year ago, and that's where I met our first key contact at Daimler. And it was great because I was giving my presentation uh, during the startup day, and he raised his hand and said, hey, what if I told you that I want this now? And I said, let's do a project together. So here we are. I heard about CO2 transformation to CO. And my job mainly was building up a production chain from capturing CO2 to making a plastic part, which was this. And this is the beginning of a new uh, journey. To my opinion, uh, we really uh, can uh, transform CO2 into a product. Well, I really loved it to work together with this startup Opus. They really pushed me into uh, building up this uh, production uh, chain and I really trusted in the project and I believe in the result. We achieved a very good result in the end. We made a part that really could go into a Mercedes-Benz car. So Startup Autobahn supported me a lot. We uh, went to suppliers to talk to them and trying to convince them. Startup Autobahn helped me in uh, writing a book of requirements that we have sent to Opus. Uh, because we bought in the end uh, one of these electrolyzers as Daimler, it's ours, and it was a very nice collaboration with Startup Autobahn. Now back to today's topic, customer journey. The concept of customer journey refers to the process a customer experiences with a company and their product or service. In other words, what sort of experience customers have from when they first walk in the door of a shop, when they leave with their purchase and even beyond. As this pandemic is likely to have a sustained impact on how companies engage with their customers, the transition to a fully digital customer journey has never been more important. This session will provide insights into how automakers can remain relevant by embarking on digital first experiences and online channels. Topics that will be covered are contactless sales, virtual showrooms, digital retail, and remote guided sales solutions. Due to COVID-19, businesses must now rethink customer care. In times of crisis, there is a shift to placing a much higher focus on needs rather than wants, and then it's, that it's more important than ever to meet your customers where they are today. Demand patterns have shifted, the desire for contactless retail solutions have magnified. Consumers are asking for digital sales processes that are intended to reduce personal contact to an absolute minimum. Digital-led experiences have to be built in order to fulfill customers' expectations and to build a strong relationship to the customer. 
The startups that we are seeing today are helping to boost digitization by transforming the traditional retail concept from offline sales to online sales. Visionary 777, a startup from Singapore, is providing a VR and AR platform that enables virtual showrooms and interactive product demos. This helps to attract new customers and maintain already existing relationships and also to enhance contactless retail activities. Crickle, a startup from London, on the other hand, is a sales platform for remote guided selling. The platform allows sellers to present in a customized and branded live environment, perfect for products that require guidance by an expert and are characterized by high transaction value, for example, cars. Bambuser, a startup from Stockholm, is also important to mention when it comes to new retail concepts. They are offering a solution for live streaming. Bambuser's broadcasting technology allowed brands to offer a live video shopping experience. Another important topic when it comes to digital-led customer experience is how to tra transfer emotions. Content is key. Providing personalized and individualized content to the customer is more important than ever. One of the startups we are having here today, Estocs from Stuttgart, helps to aggregate sales promoting information from different sources like social media, YouTube and press releases to provide tailored solutions along the customer journey. Last but not least, Listener, a startup from the US. Listener has developed a data over sound platform. So a device with their software can detect, transmit and receive data within audio range. This allows for vast amounts of opportunities. For retailers and mobility companies, this enables checkout experiences throughout the customer journey. Mobile checkout, curbside pickup, delivery and trip verification, as well as access control and ticketing are only some of the use cases that can be solved with their technology. All five startups are tackling the ever-changing customer demand patterns by helping brands to digitize their sales and retail. By 2023, it is estimated that the global retail e-commerce sales will nearly double. This would mean that one in every five dollars will be carried out online. When looking at Europe, online retail sales is expected to grow by 11 percent. Car companies expect to sell 25 percent of their cars online by 2025. Those numbers show the huge opportunity of e-commerce and that there is no better time than now to invest in new solutions and the transformation towards a digital-led customer journey. There is huge potential in shaping the future of sales together with emerging tech companies, young startups and entrepreneurs to meet customers' expectations and to create something new. We are really looking forward to great pitches and we hope to see some of the technologies not only on paper, but also in reality. Um, overall, before we start, thanks to all the startups for joining us today. And already here, there are some amazing follow-up meetings coming soon and if you are interested to get in touch with any of the startups if you're interested in like uh, getting a little more about the technologies please write the venture team and me and we are happy to connect a few weeks ago um, i was with jens the ceo and co-founder of black lane together on a podcast uh, podcast about the new normal and today he's live in our studio let's test it again jens can you hear me well? I can hear you perfectly well. Can you hear me? This is good, but I cannot hear you. So maybe Aaron Basti, what should we do that I can hear Jens and ask him? Or like see, I can ask you questions, of course, but I cannot see you. So can nobody uh, hear me or perfect. just you can't hear me? Hello? No, Jens. Wonderful. I can hear you. <laughs> no, you can? Great. And everybody can see Jens? Asking our own question. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you, Jens. Hi. <laughs> Welcome uh, in our virtual world here. And maybe before we start with some more questions, maybe can you introduce yourself as well what Black Lane is doing? Sure. Thank you very much for the invitation, Hannah and team, first of all. Um, so um, I'm, I'm Jens. Um, I'm one of the two co-founders and the CEO of Black Lane. Black Lane is a um, I would now say grown up, scale up, um, um, uh, that has been founded eight, nine years ago. Um, we started actually to build a marketplace that um, that wanted to bring supply and demand in the, I would say, like high quality transportation area together. So if you consider international limousine services, chauffeur services, professional driving services of, of such mm -hmm. a kind, uh, we wanted to vet uh, the supply and um, we said democratize it so by better um, utilization, bringing down price points to make it accessible for, for a broader audience. That was the initial idea over the years. Um, 
uh, we just added more and more services. Um, so generally speaking, um, Blacklane is now here to take the stress out of travel. Um, that's our ambition. And there are a lot of stressful components even now, um, probably even more than ever before. Um, so we have a lot to do. We have to love to do it. This is not a <laughs> negative thing. And before we speak a little bit more about the challenge you face with your company, uh, of course, you are in the whole mobility space. What do you think coronavirus kind of changed in the mobility sector? So, so to answer this, I think I, I would uh, differentiate this into two pieces. One is like um, how has movement itself um, been developed or affected? Um, and then also what modes of uh, mobility um, play play a major role or have, be, have been influenced the most. Um, so in terms of movement, what we have all e experienced ourselves was that um, when it started to hit the world, um, already actually end of last year and then early this year, um, and Blackland is an international company. I don't know um, if, all, if the audience know that we are uh, present in over 50 countries worldwide, actually our largest market being in the US. Um, Germany is tiny little um, on our um, revenue side, um, but we are also present in Asia. So we all realized that at some point in the past um, towards the change of the year and in Europe, it really hit um, beginning of March that cities um, countries and cities went into lockdown um, and there was not much left for for mobility on the mobility side. Mm -hmm. Um, so we basically only saw um, um, e-commerce delivery, food delivery uh, of such a kind um, still being mobile, if you will, out there. But um, passenger mobility was kind of at a standstill. Um, now we see like uh, also again starting the trend in Asia and then um, moving uh, over to Europe and then US. We have seen cities wakening up again. So mobility started to play a role again within city borders. People went out of their homes um, for the first time again. Um, and now we are actually at the tipping point of uh, domestic travel kicking back in. So mobility gets a little longer distance. People are more willing also with, uh, within summer vacation periods to go out um, into um, mm -hmm. some further destination. Um, but they're still in a controllable environment um, before it becomes really international. So international travel is still quite, quite slow and down and will probably also not change in the foreseeable future. So that's with regards to mobility um, itself. Um, when it comes to the modes of mobility, um, we are already also as Blacklane, we are seeing changes towards more um, controllable environments. Yeah, so um, you are um, you are you are dealing with uh, you you want to you want to be mobile with uh, with modes of transportation that you can control um, that are. Mm -hmm free of, of where, where the risk uh, is, is smaller, i.e. the um, mass transportation modes um, have a bit of a problem um, going forward, while um, private spaces, controllable spaces uh, will probably have a bit of an advantage over, over others. So your main customer, I think, was on the beginning more the traveler people from the airports and you stayed a second ago, like long distance driving could be uh, a shift now to uh, Corona. So are you changing a little bit your business model um, as well, or like this what you um, offered beforehand? Uh, yeah. More interesting for the audience? Uh, yes, um, I, I think so, we, we, we must. Um, so to be honest, for the last eight, nine years, we grew um, quite significantly to an over 100 million um, euro um, uh, organization, more than 400 people around the globe. and. Um, and we're pretty much focused um, and concentrated on, um, on um, our bread and butter business, which was the airport mm -hmm. transfer um, business. Uh, so very much, very close to airline industry, very close to airport um, logistics. Um, and when, when this go, goes away, when, when all airlines are grounded, all planes are grounded, then basically our business disappears. And this is what, what has happened. Now we realize that actually we do have a very valuable um, um, product um, and a very valuable um, supply in our network that uh, is is so much more and so much uh, more valuable than than only running for airport transfers. Mm -hmm. um, and what we have now seen is actually the black lane average distance that we are serving has more than doubled. Um, um, more than every second uh, euro that we are earning is on long distance rides so from one city to another. Um, so instead of using Black Lane to get to the airport and fly maybe a short haul flight or so to the next city, um, Black Lane itself is used for an door to door um, uh, transportation over hundreds and hundreds of miles, if you will. Uh, but Distance again, in a very, though, yeah, in a very comfortable like environment. Stuttgart to Berlin. Stuttgart or, to Berlin, yeah. Distance. 
So we are like every second uh, euro is a long distance uh, transfer, uh, what we we call long distance everything over 100 kilometers, but um, only in this group of, um, of, of businesses, of bookings that we see, the average distance is over 400 uh, kilometers. Um, so it's really like it's from one city in a country to another city and there are all sorts of like New York, Philadelphia and Dubai, Abu Dhabi, those sorts of destinations are becoming more and more of our of our business. That doesn't mean the old backend business is going away, but it's it will slowly recover and it's also doing this right now. Um, but we need to diversify as a company to not run into a similar risk again in the future. Mm -hmm. And today we look and like in like this uh, hygiene topics as well like how to act with customers and if i'm like with this driver like 400 kilometers in one car i think there's something you have to change as well how this it's a small place uh, a car and what did you do like internally in the company i think on one side in the car but as well in the communication with yeah. the customer well, we are quite lucky that we actually already had a very, very clean and very professional product at hand, right? Blackland was always very high, a high level of hygiene, a high level of professionalism. Um, our chauffeurs were always very clean. The cars were always being uh, cleaned after every ride. So that was already the right direction. But you are right, we had to um, um, even increase those uh, those standards. Um, and, and we have done so along various angles, such as the, the, the drivers uh, and the chauffeurs are screened every day. Every um, After every ride, um, the, the full car, the entire car has been dis disinfected. We do not offer handshakes anymore, but rather a slight bow. We have put magazines and, and stuff out of the car. So everything that is like um, carries some, some sort of risk has been eliminated. Um, and we have done also, uh, we have communicated this broadly and, and offensively as well, because it must be, um, be named. And there's a lot of uncertainty in the world, um, especially in, in travel. Um, and we, we want to make sure that people understand how safe our product um, um, is. Mm -hmm. Do you see a difference? Like we have a really international audience right now as well. Like we acting really international. You, uh, it's like Americans acting different than Europeans than Asians, or were they kind of the same concerns from the beginning? It's uh, it's it's similar. So actually, also we as Blacklane, we are being called for um, and I've been asked for border border openings, border control, and and all those sorts of things. How countries are opening up again? So we are becoming kind of an expert in in answering those sorts of questions. Um, international travel is down wherever you look, um, and we we had some decent revenue in Asia, but us as a as a name as a black lane brand, we're not very um, well known in in the Asian market. So mm -hmm. all the business that we were running in Asia was actually uh, delivered by U.S. or European travelers going there or getting out of um, the Asian market. Um, so this is and, and this is also reflected in our current numbers. Our revenue now is pretty much divided 50-50 by U.S. and Europe. Um, because the rest first needs to uh, needs to um, be uh, willing to, to to travel internationally again. Okay, cool. I have like one more last question, but I see there are a lot of questions in the chat. So maybe we can get one question from the chat. I don't know if maybe my team can just read it, or I, I'm happy to look for. It. Just give me a sign, Aaron, a question. Not sure I have, you can hear Yeah, we can hear you. Right, so um, there is a question from Jeffrey who is asking, um, how do you expect the mobility industry to change the market development due to Corona in the short, medium and the long term? I, I only heard the last couple of words. Can you repeat this, please? Mm, I can repeat, I think. Oh, it yeah, was like okay. about how the whole mobility space is changing, like right now, middle term and long term. Yeah. Um, so what, what I mentioned earlier, like in the in the short run, everything has has been put into perspectives, and uh, there's only a small a slow recovery. Um, especially inner city mobility is is uh, is, is is still quite is quite active and has uh, um, um, started coming back um, um, the uh, as as the um, um, first first movers um, as city mobility starts to kick back in. Um, in the in the mid and longer run, it it will get back to also like again out out of city uh, travel, international travel, mobility um, on a, on a more global basis. Uh, but but the we expect the the customer um, the customer behaviors to change. So there is a clear tendency of avoiding 
um, mass masses, um, avoiding going through um, crowded airports, going into crowded uh, train stations. Um, um, when we, for instance, look at, at the airline industry that we are serving um, quite, quite, quite a lot, we see that economy classes are not uh, fully booked out, while business classes are um, are completely um, full. So that already shows you that um, that people are willing to also spend and and pay for um, for distance and for potential safety um, and and security. Um, so this is what uh, what 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 we are seeing. Um, um, and 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 towards probably not towards the before the end of the year, um, international mobility, international transportation will really come back. Nice. I think there's one more really good question. Um, I just can read it as well. Um, so it's a little bit about like Mercedes. I think is a shareholder at your company, and how this kind of collaboration works now in this time. Um, it has always worked well, actually. Indeed, Daimler is um, is the largest minority shareholder of Blacklane. Um, already came on board in 2013, so quite a while ago. And since then, a lot of collaboration happened along very, very many different um, dimensions. Um, it's it's a lot of best practice sharing. It's of course also um, um, sharing uh, sharing um, knowledge about markets. Uh, it's about uh, also. Uh, cars, of course, um, play a big role when we uh, when we are launching a new market, and we do have a very restricted um, also set of uh, fleet that we allow and very high standards. Um, the Mercedes-Benz brand is very much connected to actually also the Blackland brand promise. Um, so we continue to leverage this uh, partnership. Uh, we are also especially looking forward that more and more um, electric vehicles are becoming available from Mercedes-Benz because um, another trend that we see in mobility and that we have catered to already since quite some years is uh, sustainability. And so Blackland has been the first ground transportation platform of such a kind that became carbon neutral already in 2017. And since then we, we continue to, uh, to push that um, that uh, that a lever. Um, so looking forward to the EQ, EQV um, uh, coming coming back on uh, coming coming um, on board um, quite quite soon. Hopefully end of the year. It's a really really nice car. So I think there are a lot of people from Mercedes on the other side of the screen. So you heard it. It's needed now. <laughs> yeah, and think of an EQV on a long distance. You're rolling office. You have Wi-Fi on board and a plug for your laptop, and you are just going from Stuttgart to Berlin. Um, and have a full productive time um, um, online. That's that's just uh, just a good product. Yeah, I think you, uh, overall, like what is what you're doing is a good product, and you do a lot of advertising. Do we have any like a chance to get a voucher for the startup out of one community or for me? Um, I'm not the, the big big supporter of vouchers. Um, that's untypical no, for the mobility space. Um, but just drop me a message, and we'll we'll make something happening. <laughs> Maybe with my final question, because the time is already really running. So you had like a running system, Corona came, you had to go everything from zero, and then you got your whole like product wider. What would you give as advice for all the startups, companies, and the community, what they should do right now to stay long-term successful out of your experience? Well, I think the most cru crucial thing is that you question everything in an in a extremely transparent manner, right? It doesn't make sense also towards your teams. Um, it doesn't make sense to, to bullshit the people and just say everything is going to work out and going to be fine again and we are coming back to the old normal uh, when all of this is over and let us just hibernate and sit and wait. Um, that's not going to work. So we were very transparent, very open. It's, it was a very crucial situation, right? From a um, um, from a more than 10 million euro revenue per month um, to zero is not, not something that I wish anybody to experience. Um, and also not our 400 people, right? They were quite affected. To everybody mm -hmm. was quite, and it still is very affected. Um, it's a super difficult time. Being transparent, being um, being 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 just yourself, right? And uh, authentic, and trying to um, to continue to evolve as a product. Um, that you are never going to run in a, into a similar uh, situation again. We really hope for everyone that no one is coming back to the situation we had. And, well, is there anything else you would like to share with the audience? 
The last thing is like um, uh, that sounds quite dramatic, but at the end, every crisis is also a huge chance. And this is also what we see, right? We are working on the right things. Um, so there's a good likelihood though, so when, when things are coming back um, and, and, and the world is starting to recover that we are getting out of this uh, stronger and faster and bigger than ever before. But um, um, so always realize that it's not the end of the world and every crisis has um, its chances. I think these are wonderful words for the end, actually, for our meetup. And, and I have to say thank you for joining me today at our Future of Vehicles event. And then hopefully thank one you. day we'll meet in person. Hopefully. I hope so, too. To thank you very much. I will. I thank often you. do. I will certainly go. come there. Bye bye. Thank you so much for the invitation. Thank you. Bye. Asking my team, do we need to rebuild this or can we recap in the sitting? Hmm? Yeah, uh, the second time. Okay, so I have to wait a second. Yeah. Okay, everyone, please. So we have to rebuild real quick to go back to the normal camera and the normal sound. So you kind of see actually everyone who's working in the background. Thank you, Aaron. Um, as well, our beautiful setting. I don't know what you see actually on Promis now. <laughs> Can we just move this away or let's get this in. And you let me know if I can speak again, Norma. Is it my seat again? <laughs> so, hmm? Oh, I think I don't need it. Um, or do I need it? OK, then I would say with like the old setting from the beginning, we will end with our meetup, Future of Vehicle, hosted together with our founding anchor partner, Mercedes. And we want to say thank you to all the startups, speaker, the team you actually saw in a second ago on the side, but behind the camera, as well the amazing uh, Mercedes-Benz team. We are working in a daily base, like Philip, Mike, uh, Felix and the teams around. And if you have any questions regarding our program, want to get in touch with any of our partners, startups and something like this, please uh, yeah, get in touch with me and the team and we're happy to connect you to everyone. And actually Jens already stated uh, the perfect word that like every crisis is a chance. So I think we should take out the chance, like make the best out of it together. You don't have to do it alone. And with this, I wish you all a nice evening or you're on a different time zone, a nice morning, happy day. And again, my name is Hannah. It was a pleasure hosting you and hi from the whole Startup Autobahn team. Take care.